here in the, the library, you have these charts set up, Scott. And, you know, the first one is about where you got the, the items to wet sift. So let's talk about that. Okay. And, and we've been there. We've actually made a whole series. Right. Joshua's Conquest. We're calling it Discover Hidden Israel 1.5. <laughs> if people are looking for our video. But this is the altar area. And I think I remember when we were standing there in 2019, you said, boy, I would love to mm -hmm. go through this dump pile. And then you did. We were already dreaming at that point, and what we did shortly after that is we came back and we extracted material from the east dump and the west dump, and we wet sifted it. Now, and when you say you extracted material, there's a big, huge pile there. Yeah, it's massive. How do you do that? What did you do to get it to your wash? Okay, machine? well, it was a combination of some heavy equipment that then loaded it into trucks to get it you know, to this, where we could examine it. But some of it was literally manual labor of people down there with, with shovels into the dump pile and loading it into wheelbarrows that are then dumped. And yeah. You wouldn't know where these would have come from in the dig area or or did Adam no, we did. Paul say? Um, the, the altar material all went into the did. east dump. And, and this is where the tablet was? This discovered. is where the tablet came from. So we, uh, we kept track wisely okay. of which one we were sifting. Yes. It was labeled either E or W. I got it. Okay, and you did not sift the center. No. So there's more to do. Yes, uh, the, the center is primarily from this area before room house, mm -hmm. uh, as is the west dump. And you had previously dated before the tablet discovery, the round altar below the, the square rectangular altar to be from time of Bronze. Joshua, yeah, around 1400 BC, the very beginning of the LB2 period. And also you have a, a outline of a footprint, which very few people have ever heard of that in Israel, but you and I have been to a number of these. Yeah, we had some adventures uh, yeah. going to these things. This is the last one. So if they're going up the Jordan Valley, like, you know, footprints, this would be the last one you would come to. And it's actually a footprint inside of a footprint. And the significance of that you would assume is every foot, everywhere your foot will step, right. you will gain that land. And incidentally, you are a stone's throw from El Amore here where the Abrahamic covenant was cut. So you are like right next to where the Abrahamic covenant, maybe it has to do with that idea. Mm -hmm. Wherever your feet touch, I'll give you. Mm -hmm. And then you actually have the photographs. Of course, these are blown up. <clears throat> um, so show us the size with your with your hand. Okay, of this so tablet. so it's uh, about two by two centimeters. Okay. So you know, just a little bitty guy folded in half. So it's actually two by four if it were unfolded. Mm -hmm. As far as surface to write on, you can see the fold there. This is why when I saw that it was lead and then saw that it was folded, I immediately my heart leapt because I knew that this was a, a curse tablet. And you were familiar with that. Yeah, already it's a, that it's a this genre. Was, but, um, but it's usually found later on the Second Temple period. Uh, these are, are much more common. Okay. But I was puzzled because like almost no pottery from that time period, like 0.25%, one quarter of 1% of the pottery is early Roman. The rest is from, from much, much, much earlier. So I thought, wow, this very unlikely that it's from a later time period, mm -hmm. but let's see ultimately the analysis of the lead and of the epigraphy indicated that it indeed was from the late Bronze Age. You first found it, did someone bring it to you very excited, bring you over, how did that work? So our trays were being checked by supervisors. So Frankie Snyder was working at one station and Frankie was really our most experienced small finds person who was there and as Providence would have it in her tray, she, as she was checking it, she saw it, she knew what it was. Wow. And so she got my attention and Abigail's attention and said, you guys need to come see this. And when we walked over, we saw it. And we, the three of us just kind of did a dance right there, uh, realizing that here we had a curse tablet from the Mountain of the Curse. In our highest dreams, did we think it would have this inscription on it, you know, that we would be able to recover. Would you expect to find an inscription on a curse tablet? Yes. Yeah. So so you knew, first of all, this looks exactly like what you would expect. You, could you tell it was lead right away? Yes. The weight was very clearly uh, lead. And then we had a metal detector that we checked it with also. Okay. And then were you able to initially see any inscription? I mean, yes. it looks like to me like right there. Yeah. So I remember day one seeing that with mm -hmm. the naked eye. And I remember telling Abigail, this is man-made, it's intentional, that's not random. And then, 
you know, we looked and with the naked eye, we could see that, that it did have markings. My assumption was that the text was gonna be on the inside and maybe just symbols on the outside. But as it turns out, we also have text on the outside. Okay, so in the press conference today, there was a tease about something more to come. I'm not gonna try to get that from you, but I do wanna know why, uh, where would that additional inscription or um, more letters, I guess, be? Where is that that you're not certain of yet? Well, we are certain. We're just not ready to, to go public, if you will. But the examples I'm showing you, these are text elements. And these are, so the text elements that you're that you're giving, the actual curse is on the inside. That's right. So these are the elements that you're still not releasing, but is it because of further study? What's the reason yeah, that you're holding? Yeah, we have just confirmed these. Okay. And so we double just need to double check everything, okay. but you have more text on the outside. That's what I love about Scott. There's always something else to come <laughs> back to and talk to him about. Yeah, it's a process. By the way, you're you're an Ingrace favorite. Okay, just so oh, you know, you're okay. you're up there. Not not as popular as me. Of well, course. how could one be, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, believe me, believe me. People would still watch it if I was not on. Okay, so we have the actual curse, which is uh, one of your experts says an actual legal document and like a death sentence. A binding text, okay. legal in that sense. Okay. It's a testament, it's a binding. When you make an oath in the late Bronze Age, we have many examples of these, okay? In the Hittite treaties, for example, <clears throat> they follow a five-point covenant structure. And this is what the Mosaic Covenant is. It has a five-point structure to it. Point four is blessings and curses, or God swears with an oath to bless you if you keep the terms of the covenant, Deuteronomy 27 and 28, to curse you if you don't, and it spells out what all the, the curses are. So in that sense, it's a legal binding mm -hmm. document, the same way that a marriage ceremony or contract. And you're not positive if it's the the person that uh, left the tablet, if that was his uh, statement, or is this the statement of a nation? Right. Could there be a titular head, the Joshua's scribe? Because God tells Joshua to write these things mm -hmm. on Mount Ebal. Mm -hmm. So does Joshua write it himself, Joshua ben Nun? I, we can't say that he didn't. Did he ask his scribe to, to do it? If so, then it's titular. That means it represents the whole nation they're binding themselves. Or is it an individual who's come along later, um, even a generation or two later, we don't know, <clears throat> and personally bound himself to the covenant. This tablet wasn't accidentally dropped by someone. This was right. left here on the <clears throat> And is that common? They would come to a, a place, yes. cultic place, an okay. altar? We find cursed tablets in wells, in tombs, hmm. okay? Places in the earth normally hmm. because it's sacred. They're getting them closer to, to the next world, to the deity. Okay. Even if they're pagan, they're still trying to get them like into wells and tombs and things like this. In our case, the altar is the ultimate repository, clearly intentional. Yeah. And then the curse, obviously, the, the, <clears throat> the main feature of this is the name of God. Twice. And that is also here. This is the actual inscription. This is the actual, this is the only example we're showing today okay. of the actual proto-alphabetic text. And this is what it looks like. Okay. And if you want to see what early Israelite writing, like pre-Paleo-Hebrew, writing looks like this is it and this is the name of god mm -hmm. the covenant name of god yahweh so you have a yod here and then you have a he so this man with his arms raised and we have many parallels of this in other other mm -hmm. texts so you have a yod you have a he and then you have a vav and together this is yahweh and this is the first time we have this in israel itself and from this early time period, this is mind-boggling. We have the soul of hieroglyph down in Egypt, the, the, the Shasu of the land of Yahweh. We have the Kuntilet Azrud Pithos B from like the eighth century that mentions Yahweh. But now we have hundreds, 600 years earlier at a site where a covenant renewal was, we have the covenant name of God. Well, wow. so this is something that is a monumental discovery that, um, will be studied, argued, yeah. but it's it's pretty clear cut in your mind. Like this, this is solid stuff that we're talking about. The ramifications of this are going to reverberate for generations. Um, 
Do you have a reliable biblical text? Was it written at an early period? So on many levels in academia, in scholarship, on a, on a popular faith level, uh, this, this will reverberate for a long time. So it's, it's another confirmation of the accuracy of the scriptures that I grew up believing and knowing, um, but it's, it's just that wonderful, wonderful reaffirmation maybe of that my faith isn't um, uh, silly or in vain. It's real, it's tangible. There are real right. evidences there. And this is, this is big. I mean, 3,400 years ago, someone wrote the name of Yahweh. And now here you are, millennia later, a believer and a follower of this God. And now you have the chance to see his name. The discovery, Scott, that you were fortunate enough to be part of, to, to supervise and to make, is going to shake the world a little bit because it verifies the reliability of Scripture. Because of two technologies that you used that are newer, at least not used much. One is wet sifting and the other is the scanning. Mm -hmm. So would we be sitting here if you hadn't used the wet sifting or if the scanning technology wasn't available? We would not. What a great day we live in. Um, for just such a time as this, we were able to recover the tablet through wet sifting. We were able to recover the text through tomographic scanning. If not, we, we would have missed it just like Adam Zertal had missed it. So um, it's, it's fascinating. Describe the scanning a little bit as far as you understand. It's something that you had done in Prague. Why pick Prague? Is that because they were the ones that have pioneered this type of technology? They had a track record. They had scanned lead objects before. Uh, not as thick as this, but they had published lead objects that they had scanned and recovered text. That gave me confidence that that would be a good partnership. It's a series of scans and the scans would each go a little bit deeper and deeper, micro obviously, but eventually then that all lays out in a computer program to show you what's inside. That's right. You, you have slices is what they call mm -hmm. them. So each one is numbered. And so there's countless slices that are done. And then the post-processing, the data processing that's done afterwards is extensive to, to get the slices in such a way that we can see that particular slice. When we got into the sweet spot, it was clear because the letters began to pop. Do you feel privileged, blessed, you know, maybe chosen of God to find this and mm -hmm. to be able to speak on it and publish it? I feel humbled. Um, we're grateful to be able to do the work that we're doing, first of all, in the land of Israel uh, that the Associates for Biblical Research is part of. This particular discovery seems providential, and I do feel very honored to have be able to, to lead this effort and to, to make this, this announcement. It's pretty, pretty amazing. I had never been up into the Samaria area until you took me there in 2019. And we went to Mount Ebal to film the series, right. Joshua's Conquest. And when we were there, I was amazed at, you know, this altar had been found and it had given Adam Zertal, the archeologist, a faith. You know, right. that, that while wow, the Bible actually is true, what would Adam Zertal say if he were at this press conference? What do you think? He's, he's gone now, but what would he say? It's a great question. Adam grew up on a kibbutz and they're communal, they're communist. So he grew up with no faith. And when he found this altar, he believed ultimately that he had been wrong. And even though he was a well-known academic, he said, I cannot deny that this matches the biblical account. So he became a believer in the historicity of the text. And if Adam were sitting here today, I can only imagine, you know, he was crippled in the war. And so he walked on crutches. Um, I could only imagine this smile that would go past ear to ear to realize that um, maybe it's a good thing we missed that because we didn't have the technology to know what to do with it back then, but that now his reputation and his work is being venerated. And I remember you standing on Monty Ball and you actually yelled out the curses and the blessings. And later on, we actually went down to ancient Shechem. Right. And we again talked about that. You know, it, it's almost like you're back in that time, back in that place. And this little lead tablet, it adds to the realness of that real event that happened. So what's that feeling like for you uh, to go to those places and to experience the things that 
had transpired thousands of years before. Yeah, Jim, we don't set out to prove the Bible. We're doing scientific archaeology, but we're doing it at biblical sites. And so inevitably, there's an interface between the two and questions of faith have to arise. So on a personal level, for me, it's tremendously meaningful to be able to deal with this, what I consider sacred material, a sacred responsibility to history uh, and to the God of history to accurately record uh, what we find. It's uh, meaningful to me, and I hope your, your viewers will find it meaningful as well. Yes. When someone that's liberal and doesn't doesn't believe the Bible is, mm. is accurate or reliable, what could they do with this? What possibly could they say about this discovery? I suppose that once we publish the, the entire Hebrew script, the proto-alphabetic script, that there can be argument over the combination of letters, because this can be read right to left and horizontally or vertically, so there's movement at this time in the alphabet and how you read it. The fact that these letters are proto-alphabetic is beyond dispute. How we're reading them in this case, right to left or left to right, those things can, can be argued. Well, the word actually says this rather than that and, and so forth. Proto-alphabetic is simply early alphabet. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, writing simply that people can do it quickly and easily. And, well, it's, and that it's wasn't transitional. Uh -huh. uh, it's pictographic mm -hmm. letters, mm -hmm. think hieroglyphic symbols mm -hmm. that are morphing into phonetic alphabetic symbols. So if this did not exist, Moses could not have written the pen. It would have taken a library to write the Pentateuch mm -hmm. because there's like hundreds, six or 700 hieroglyphic symbols. When you get it down to 22 or 25 or 26, but depending on the language, now they're phonetic. That's what's so important about this. There was a language that was phonetic that Moses could have used, and now we have proof. So this discovery is multi-folded. In other words, there's, there's the lead itself where it was discovered and the, what they discovered, the, the writing itself. All of these layers, kind of like the layers of the mm -hmm. tablet itself, are, are uh, speaking volumes to the God of the Bible, you know, the accuracy of the Bible. And so I'm just excited to be able to be uh, here today and to be able to talk to you about it. And congratulations. Thank you, Jim. That's awesome. I appreciate that and uh, grateful for your part in it. Thank you.